Thank you for uh, coming in and uh, logging in for this webinar. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, an overview of the process hazards analysis with uh, a little bit of focus on the HAZOP is the methodology for doing that. And uh, just to let you know, the audio is provided by the internet. Uh, I do thank you that your microphones are muted because that normally adds to some interference, that sort of thing. Uh, there is a Q&A at the top of your screen as we go through this. Feel free to type in questions at the end of the presentation. I'll go back up here, look at all the questions, and uh, we will try to answer them as best we can. So uh, just before we get started, uh, for those who are not familiar with Exida, uh, we've been around since 1999 when we were founded. We've got uh, offices throughout the world. Uh, and whether you're an automation supplier, integrator, end user, automotive, OEM and supplier, uh, we can help with uh, various complex issues related to functional safety, cybersecurity, and alarm management. Uh, we've provided uh, extensive certification to a number of uh, functional safety and security standards, such as uh, IEC 61508, 61511, ISO 26262, also the ISA Security Compliance Institute. And in fact, we've actually certified more process safety devices to IEC 61508 than any other agency worldwide. Uh, so we're pretty well suited, whether you're an end user, manufacturer, uh, to help out with uh, whatever your needs, offer education and uh, software tools to help with the uh, life cycle process. Just a little bit about myself. Um, Mechanical engineer, uh, prior to working with Exeter for the last three years, I was at Air Products and Chemicals. Uh, started out as a process control engineer for about a decade, and then the remaining 26 plus years, I was in process safety. Uh, with Exeter, continuing to do a lot of the things that I was doing at Air Products um, in the end user consulting world, and whether that's uh, consoling the process safe, the process industry for IEC 61511 or cyber risk assessment. Uh, also, the, I'm the product manager for our PHA and LOCA tools, as well as our cyber software tool that we're now developing. Um, I continue to be a member of the uh, ISA S84 committee. I chair the working group nine subcommittee of that uh, related to cybersecurity for safety instrumented systems and have been an active participant in multiple technical reports uh, within the Center for Chemical Process Safety. I participate in uh, process equipment reliability database initiative where I used to be the chair, now I'm their current technical consultant and have also participated in a variety of uh, guideline books that CCPS has published, the most recent uh, book for initiating events and independent protection layers for use in LOPA. So during this webinar, uh, we're going to provide an overview of the uh, process hazards analysis. Uh, look at the work process, what the expectations are. Uh, we're going to look at what process safety information is actually necessary to conduct that hazard review. We'll also take a look at how management of change factors into the overall hazard review work process. Um, and as I stated before, uh, for the methodology for doing the hazard identification piece of the PHA, uh, we will be looking at HAZOP in a little bit more depth. First, let's look at the overall uh, PHA work process through the life of a facility. Um, 
if you start with a green field plan, um, you've got to first develop your scope. Uh, you create process safety information, which is a requirement in order to conduct your hazard review. Those two bolded boxes will be um, sort of the focus for this webinar. After you've identified hazards, typically there's a number of recommendations. There may have to be some additional analysis performed, either using uh, layer of protection analysis, fault tree analysis, consequence analysis. Once all of that's done, the design's complete. You go through a pre-startup safety review. After that, uh, you're in, you go through startup. You operate the plant. Uh, during operation, uh, you, if you make changes, you have to have a management exchange process in place. And when you do that, you recycle back to as far back in the process as necessary, depending upon how big the, uh, uh, the change is. Uh, but in all cases, one would want to go back and refer to the hazard review documentation to determine if you're impacting the risk of your uh, facility or not. Uh, after some period of time, there's an expectation if you're an OSHA PSM site or if other standards such as uh, the COMA work process, the control of major accident hazards in the UK, they will require a revalidation, uh, oftentimes on a five-year basis. And then you go back and you look at the whole work process again to see if there's been any changes and to make sure that everything is still uh, meeting corporate risk criteria. So the first step is to actually perform that initial process hazard analysis. Uh, and as I stated before, that's a requirement if your processes are covered by standards such as OSHA Process Safety Management Standard or COMA, which is the control of major accident hazards. Um, what methodology you use it's all intended to identify, evaluate, and control the hazards. Depending upon how complex your process is, there's a variety of methods that uh, can be used. Uh, methodologies that uh, are out there for you include what if, checklist, what if checklist, hazard operability studies, that's the HAZOP that we're going to focus on today a little bit. Uh, failure mode and effects analysis, also known as FMEA, fault tree analysis, and basically any other appropriate uh, methodology that uh, allows you to uh, identify and evaluate hazards that uh, you may uncover. Uh, when you Perform the process hazard and risk analysis. Um, you're supposed to look at that not only the hazards of the process, but also take a look at any previous incidents, either within the company or within industry, that had a likely potential for catastrophic conse consequences in your workplace. Uh, very important to review site company incidents, but uh, I also recommend that you look at industry incidents. Um, all of these things give you a good amount of insight. Uh, you want to look at uh, engineering administrative controls applicable to the hazards and their interrelationships, such as appropriate application of detection methodologies that help you provide early warning of releases. I include those two. Uh, various acceptable detection methods might include process monitoring, control instrumentation, where you take advantage of alarms, uh, detection hardware such as uh, gas detectors, toxicity detectors. Uh, you want to look at your administrative controls to make sure that. Uh, 
you're going to be relatively free from systematic failures. Uh, and in addition to the HAZOP, you're supposed to look at both your facility siting and human factors uh, as part of all of that. Um, and finally, a qualitative evaluation of the uh, safety, the possible safety and health effects of failure controls on employees. That needs to be documented on the review worksheets. When you put together the uh, PHA team, you need a minimum of two people. If you need someone who is knowledgeable in the methodology being used, and you need someone knowledgeable in the process. Uh, generally, when you're doing an actual process having a risk assessment analysis, uh, you'll have a number of other people. Typical teams would include process safety engineer, process engineer, operations representatives, uh, control engineer, depending upon the uh, equipment, if it's brand new equipment just coming out of R&D, you may have R&D personnel there for processes that um, have been around for a while. Um, you would not need the R&D folks, but you need the uh, process engineers who so have a good understanding of it. If you're looking at rotating machinery or special machinery, you would bring in those specific design disciplines as necessary. Oftentimes, you'll have pressure vessel engineers involved um, because of the metallurgy and those kinds of things. So the key thing is that you need the team that has the necessary expertise in both the engineering and the process operations. When you go through and actually perform and you make recommendations, then you also need a management system in place that allows you to address the team's findings and recommendations in a timely manner. Uh, they need to be documented as to what actions are to be taken. And as I said, they also have to be resolved in a timely manner to uh, support the process. I can't emphasize enough that when you actually document your findings, it's very, very important to uh, document document your recommendations, document uh, just the whole thought process that you've used to identify the hazards in a way that allows people to understand what was done who were not actually part of the team. Uh, very, very important that you get that documentation clear, make it unambiguous. You don't really want to leave any room for interpretation. Um, when the HAZOP is documented, uh, recognize that that's going to be around for the life of the, the process, life of the facility, and it should be a basis for helping with management of change and uh, you're going to come back and revisit it again in five years, so you really want to do a good job with the documentation. Here's uh, the IEC 61511 safety life cycle, and it was essentially built upon foundation of the OSHA process safety management life cycle. Uh, but it was just with more of a focus towards safety instrument and systems uh, portion of your protective systems. Um, so just recognize that uh, regulatory standards have sort of defined the work process. Um, and uh, when you look at the safety life cycle going through here, you can see that one of the first things you're supposed to do is that process hazard and risk analysis. After that, you start to figure out what layers of protection you have uh, in the event that some of those layers of protection need to be a safety instrumented uh, function as part of the safety instrumented system. 
then you need to allocate how much risk reduction is necessary there. You then go in and design that, make sure that uh, all your layers of protection are actually achieving the risk reduction that uh, you've determined you need. Uh, prior to your uh, pre-startup safety review, you would, for a safety instrument system, you would go in and do a factory acceptance test for complex equipment, install it, commission it, validate it as part of the pre-startup safety review. Then you would go into operation and maintenance, effect modification, managing the change as necessary, and periodically go back in and uh, revalidate this whole work process. In order to uh, to perform process hazards analysis, uh, you need process safety information. This is a requirement right from standards like OSHA PSM. Uh, process safety information is supposed to include information pertaining to the hazards of the highly hazardous chemicals used or produced by the process information pertaining to the process technology and information pertaining to the equipment in the process. Uh, also like to mention that uh, it is expected that at a minimum there's a baseline compliance with RAGAGEP and that stands for recognized and generally accepted good engineering practices. With that foundation in place then your, the, the review process is intended to identify those situations where that basic ragged gap might be insufficient uh, with respect to your satisfying your corporate risk criteria. We're, we're really on the lookout for low likelihood but very, very high severity type events. Those are the things where you want to spend your resources to uh, lower that risk. Back in the old days, prior to OSHA PSM, a lot of the standards were very, very prescriptive in nature. Uh, with the advent of OSHA PSM and standards like COMA, uh, you're now starting to see performance-based standards where just because you say you have something, uh, it may or may not be good enough. And even if every plant has a high pressure interlock, uh, the integrity and the risk reduction capability of that uh, high pressure interlock may or may not be the same. And if it's not the same, uh, you have to ask yourself the question, how good does it have to be? And only when I know how good it has to be and I've actually determined that I can achieve that level of risk reduction, uh, that's the kind of thing that you're trying to achieve with performance-based standards so that at the end of the day, you are satisfying your corporate risk criteria. With respect to the uh, hazardous chemical information that uh, you're supposed to have. Uh, you have to start looking at things like toxicity information to determine effects on personnel in the event of uh, a loss of containment. Uh, oftentimes what we're concerned with is inhalation toxicity. Um, there's a number of values out there in the industry that uh, address different levels of impact, different mechanisms for exposure. Uh, so for instance, if you see terms like LD50, that's the lethal dose, where 50% of the population would die, that's more of an ingestion uh, measure. Uh, lethal concentration, or LC50, is an inhalation uh, number where that's where 50% of the population is expected to die in the event that they are exposed to a specific concentration for 60 minutes. Then you have other terms like ERPG, 1, 2, and 3, 
those are emergency response planning guidelines um, ranging from odor up to threshold of fatality. AEGL, similar to ERPGs, uh, they are acute emergency guideline limits once again ranging from odor up to threshold of fatality but those they uh, actually have, provide those kind of numbers for different durations of exposure uh, you also need physical data in order to do any engineering or consequence modeling uh, reactivity data and uh, thermal chemical stability data is important to help understand needed control limits and any potential consequences uh, should you deviate beyond those limits. Um, the reactivity grid is particularly good for if you inadvertently mix different chemicals. Uh, you want to understand what kind of undesired reactions you, you might uh, you might have. This is uh, uh, this is particularly important in batch chemical plants, but uh, even in continuous plants, if you get contaminants into the process, you could have metallurgical corrosion issues that manifest themselves. Uh, you could also if you, for instance, you get a flammable gas plant and you have some ingestion of air, obviously you can have fire and or explosions. Uh, with regard to your materials of construction, corrosivity data is needed. Uh, you got to make sure that uh, you can determine what the useful life is for your pressure containing equipment. And uh, generally, there's a lot of good information in the MSDS sheets, material safety data sheets. Uh, oftentimes, those MSDS sheets provide a lot of the data that I just referenced above. So that's a very, very good source. When you're looking at the process technology information, um, you normally start off with a sub, either a block flow diagram or some simplified process flow diagram uh, with a written uh, process description that, that uh, just explains what's going on with that uh, PFD. Um, those kind of documents allow people to gain a fairly quick understanding of the process at a high level. Um, you also need to understand uh, what kind of process chemistry is going on as part of the uh, overall process. A list of chemicals on site should be put together, should be available. It should list their maximum intended inventory. Um, and once you've created this list of all chemicals and materials on site, uh, that makes it pretty easy to create that re reactivity grid that I referenced on the previous slide where you're just looking at binary mixtures or binary coming together of two different materials. Uh, think of it as a big spreadsheet table. You get your X and Y axis and when you intersect any two of those materials, what can happen? Uh, the process engineer prior to the PHA should be uh, documenting safe upper and lower limits for all the appropriate process parameters. Um, it would uh, certainly include things like temperatures, pressures, flows, composition, but might not necessarily be limited to just those depending upon the process. When you go through the HAZOP or any other uh, methodology that uh, you happen to choose to use, um, you want to take a look at what are the potential consequences for any of the deviations that could occur. With respect to the equipment, um, going into the PHA, you need to know the materials of construction. You definitely have to have piping and instrumentation diagrams where you're uh, able to 
look at uh, all of the equipment, how it's tied together, combine that with the process flow diagram, any heat material balance information that you would have. Um, also are required to have electrical classification drawings. Need to know what the basis of design for your relief system is, what sizing cases for each of the relief devices, if you've got headered material, uh, what, what are the ground rules for uh, the design basis of the headers. Uh, also, what is the basis of any ventilation systems that you would have for uh, indoor or uh, equipment inside of enclosures. Also important to understand what design codes are being employed. Uh, if there's any exceptions to any of those codes, those need to be uh, spiked out. As I said before, material and energy balance is important. And uh, P&ID should also be able to show you what kind of safety systems are at least anticipated. You're looking at interlocks, det detection and suppression systems, those types of things. Management change. Need to be, uh, you need to have a written procedure for management change. And anytime you have changes to process chemicals, technology, equipment, or procedures, the management and change procedure should be uh, put into effect and executed. Uh, the only exception to management of change not needing to be done is where you actually have a pure replacement in kind where no actual changes are being made. The, the design's the same, uh, all, all the requirements, none of those have changed. Uh, so if you're, for instance, if, if you're changing out a relief valve and you're replacing the same relief valve with the same size, same materials of construction, no changes, then you would not need to do an MOC. The procedures need to ensure that the technical basis for the proposed change is documented. You got to include the impact of the change on the safety and health. Uh, any modifications to operating procedures, you need those to be documented. And as a matter of fact, if generally these uh, regulatory standards like OSHA, PSM, and COMA actually require you to validate that your standard procedures or your procedures are up to date on an annual basis. Um, oftentimes, the timing of the change uh, can be very, very important. Recognize you've got multiple shifts. Uh, you need to be able to communicate when the change is going to occur, who's responsible for what. Uh, you might have a temporary change that's only going to be enforced for a, uh, let's say, a month, and then it times out, and it's got to be put back to uh, how it was before. That needs to be uh, documented and communicated. Uh, any documentation that is affected by the change needs to be updated. Uh, that includes the process safety information, operating procedures, practices. Um, at the end of the day, um, you should really look at the man any management exchange that's required as like a mini process hazards analysis, okay, going through all of the same steps where you have at least someone knowledgeable with the methodology and the appropriate person or persons that are knowledgeable on the process or equipment and or equipment that is being impacted. Now we get into the actual HAZOT methodology. Um, you can see from this uh, screen shows the overall flow on performing a HAZOT. Uh, it all starts with a scope. You've got to have accurate process information and a team that possesses the necessary knowledge and skills that uh, we've talked about on the previous slides. In order to make the review more efficient, uh, you want to prepare 
prior to the meeting with the full team. Uh, during preparation, key information such as nodes and their intention as input to whatever software you are using to uh, support documentation of the review. A node is a section or a portion of the process. Uh, think of that as a piping circuit. It could be a vessel, it could be a pump. Uh, when you're actually looking at procedures, it could be a procedural operating step. So these are just uh, examples of how you can break up nodes. Uh, during the meeting, you go through a node by node review. Each node should have uh, applicable uh, parameter intentions documented. That's the importance of your process safety information. When you review a node, you take a parameter such as a pressure or a temperature and you apply an appropriate deviation, like high or low. So you can have high pressure, low pressure, high temperature, low temperature. Those would be examples. When you apply that deviation to that node, then you start asking yourself the question, what could cause that deviation? And so you list those causes. And those causes should be listed separately and not in a big paragraph because Depending upon the cause, there may be slightly or somewhat different consequences. So the consequences uh, should then be documented. Uh, also, depending upon what cause, uh, what causes or there are, uh, different safeguards may not provide protection against every cause. Some of them may only provide protection against some causes. So that's the other reason why you document the causes separately so that you can come up with proper documentation of what consequence applies if that cause occurs and what specific safeguards apply to that combination of cause and consequence. Fair. After you've looked at uh, Oh, um, when you do that, uh, you identify your safeguards, and uh, you, as a team, you've either determined that your risk criteria is met, or you determine that uh, you've got a problem. If you believe you have a problem, then you've got to come up with some sort of resolution, generally in the way of recommendations. Uh, once you've looked at all the deviations, you go on to the next parameter. After you've done that for all of the parameters, uh, you go on to the next node. And after you've done all of the nodes, then you document the HAZOP portion of the PHA report. This gives you some examples of, uh, it's not necessarily a fully complete list of parameters, but it's a pretty good list of parameters. Uh, those are the typical guide words. You can apply uh, those guide words to each parameter um, to come up with your deviations. One of the things that uh, Exit has done with its software is to look at those deviations and then take a look at typical nodes, and we call them smart deviations, where uh, if you go back to the previous slide and you put together a big spreadsheet of all those guide words against all those parameters, that can be a lot of deviations you've got to go through. Well, depending upon the node type, not all of those deviations are going to be applicable. So that's why one way to think through it is to, if you take a look at nodes and you ask the question, okay, here's my exhaustive list of deviations. Which, which of those deviations actually apply to this type of a node? That's what we're trying to do here. Here's a uh, screenshot of a typical HAZOP worksheet where you can see you've got your node, this particular worksheet. 
also allows you to uh, organize nodes by units. Uh, you can see the deviation in the upper left corner also. Uh, down in the worksheet itself, you've got your cause. Uh, there's some likelihood of that cause. The consequence that can occur due to that cause. Um, whether or not it's a safety issue, a business issue, or an environmental issue. Then for each of those, you're beginning to look at your safeguards and uh, what the likelihood with the safeguard is, what risk you have. Then um, you come up with whatever recommendations you believe are appropriate. Typical HAZOP team, you have a facilitator. Uh, and, well, facilitator is generally your team leader that would be knowledgeable in the methodology. Uh, sometimes the facilitator also scribes, uh, but in other cases you've got an actual facilitator and a scribe so that uh, it can be a little bit more efficient that way. Uh, for a process industry, you'd almost always have a process engineer. I can't imagine not having a process engineer. You really do want operations input, so an operator or operator representative would be there. Those are the key people, and then the other functional experts as necessary. Process safety, maintenance, uh, in design, might be pressure vessel and piping, might be a controls engineer, might be a rotating machinery engineer, uh, might have environmental folks there. So, looking at the strengths and limitations of uh, HAZOP, uh, certainly HAZOP has been around for quite a while now, so it is time tested. It is a very disciplined approach that's fairly easy to use. Uh, if the team maintains their discipline, it becomes a very rigorous hazard identification technique. You can apply it to any size project. You can apply it to equipment. You can apply it to procedures. Uh, it addresses not just hazards, but uh, you can also address operational and maintenance concerns. Uh, generally, the HAZ part of the HAZOP represents about 20%, and the operational part of the HAZOP is generally about 80% of, uh, you know, what gets uncovered. And at the end of it, uh, you've got some very, very straightforward documentation. Uh, on the limitation disadvantages side, uh, it is totally a qualitative judgment. Uh, versus a quantitative risk approach. Uh, so oftentimes people like to do the HAZOP for the identification and where they have complex uh, problems or they don't feel comfortable that they, they fully understand something, they will supplement on an exception basis either doing a LOPA or some sort of fault tree or consequence analysis to help out. Uh, where the qualitative judgment just isn't getting you there. Um, part of that is because the HAZOP methodology is not amenable to complex issues, uh, whereas when you're looking at something like fault tree or MOPA, uh, you, you have a better tool for looking at stuff that's a little bit more complex. Here's an example of a uh, Hazard Review Report with its associated uh, table of contents. You can see that in a PHA report, it's not just the HAZOP worksheets. There's a lot of that other stuff that's referring back to uh, the process safety information, um, the facility siting, the human factors review, all of those things make up the total Hazard Review Report. When you do document the HAZOP, um, it really is important to recognize that uh, 
th this is your opportunity to document the basic understanding that allows you to communicate that basic understanding to people who are going to come into the process uh, in years to come, people who were not part of the actual review. So properly documented, the, the HAZOP documentation becomes a resource for not just communication, but for training. Uh, it should really be looked at as an essential document to support management of change. And uh, unfortunately, uh, it's also there if you have an incident investigation to figure out whether it, it can help you figure out what went wrong. Uh, you might identify something that wasn't considered, uh, but it's certainly something that's going to get looked at as part of an incident investigation. So in summary, uh, we looked at the overall life cycle. Uh, we talked about some of the uh, PHA expectations. We emphasized how important the process safety information is in order to conduct a, uh, a process hazard uh, analysis. Uh, irrespective of what methodology is used. Also talked about uh, how management of change fits into the overall life cycle and how it relates to the, uh, the PHA documentation. And uh, finally, we looked at the HAZOP methodology in a little bit more detail. So um, let's take a look to uh, see if there was any questions, and uh, I don't see any at this point in time, um, if you would uh, care to uh, unmute your, uh, if you could unmute, uh, you can feel free to uh, ask any questions that uh, you may have. Oh, it's only one way. I'm sorry, I, I, I was, I did not understand. You cannot unmute your phone, so if you have any questions, you're going to have to type a question in here. Um, I would be uh, happy to uh, answer any that you have. While you're thinking about that, uh, I just want to uh, thank you for uh, attending today. I'm certainly hopeful that uh, it provided you some better understanding of the overall work process. Okay. Um, well, I don't see any questions coming in. Oh, there we go. Um, okay, uh, Sandra. It really depends on a couple of things. Uh, fundamentally, if, if I'm doing a process industry process with a PNID, I would start out by saying I really want to use a HAZOP as a starting point at least the first time. If I'm looking at a piece of equipment, then, and the hazards associated with that equipment, then the failure mode and effect analysis becomes as good as, and in some cases better than the HAZOP. If I stay with a uh, process, you know, a chemical, uh, say a 
chemical, petrochemical type process. I really want to do a HAZOP first, but if I'm able to standardize that process to the point where I'm not really making any changes, I, I have a product line, for instance. Uh, once I get it to a product line where I'm selling many, many of the same thing, then I would prefer to take that HAZOP, take a look at what safeguards I have, uh, and turn it into a checklist type of review. And as part of the checklist, I would go through and, and, and verify that things haven't changed. If if there were changes, then I want to execute management of change, and to the extent that changes have been made, I'm going to employ, uh, say, more advanced techniques like uh, HAZOP to uh, do more of a deep drill of, of what's going on for those changes. Uh, in all cases, what if HAZOP FMEA, they're not quantitative in nature, they're qualitative in nature. So for where I have very, very high severity um, consequence or very, very high severity consequences, or where I have uh, a very, very complex system that really qualitatively you can't really get your hands around properly, then I would like to supplement HAZOP with things like uh, a more rigorous LOPA or a fault tree analysis for pieces of it possibly, uh, where if I don't necessarily fully understand uh, how, how bad the consequences could be or I think maybe they may not be as bad as we're assuming, then I would want to uh, do consequence analysis. I hope that answered your question. Any other questions? If not, then I would like to thank you again. And I hope you have a great rest of the day. And as I said, uh, I, I hope this uh, was of value to you. So with